Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey, okay, so we're back. Jeff is already having a heart attack. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome, everybody, back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. It is episode 136. Uh, today is July 22nd, 2019. You're listening to or maybe even watching a really, really fun episode of Human Factors Cast. Fun for you. Maybe the best one we've ever done. <laughs> I, I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm also joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, off to the other side of the table from me. Yeah. And sitting in the middle of us, uh, back once again since episode 99, uh, is Mr. Jeff Olson. Hey, I've never actually made an, like a visual appearance on this uh, podcast, but I was... Uh, in audio in an audio form for <laughs> episode 99 i am the i'm jeff olson the editor for the human factors cast and everything the and video editor but let's be clear uh you are not video editing this episode and you are having a heart attack because i am doing that live okay, in the so, moment <laughs> yes so <laughs> let me explain how this is working so i took it upon my or i think you guys requested it yeah it, um, it's a it's a mutual thing so what i did was i took so usually what happens is on Mondays after they record the podcast, they send me everything, and then I put it together in Premiere Pro, and then I export it, and then I release it the next day. What I've done uh, is get everything into like a, a workable version on OBS, which is the recording software, and I've set it up so that these guys can do all the editing manually like as they go. So like all they have to do is before the show starts, they just put all the stuff that they need in and then uh and then while they're doing the episode they can just click and transition all the scenes themselves uh so that means i'm not gonna have to edit the monday podcast anymore so i'll be taking more of a limited editor sort of deal going on so you'll still be support staff you'll still be a part of the human factors family uh and you're always welcome on the show um but yeah you're gonna have a heart attack this episode because i'm sitting here clicking around with all the things that you have so kindly set up for us. And if you notice anything wonky with uh, the audio this week or it, with the video, uh, that's Jeff's fault. You can get to him at Offlineable on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I have several, <laughs> several objections. All right. So I set it up and then these guys and Nick was like, it would be really funny is if he doesn't know how any of this works. And I was just showing him how it works and he's never used it before. And I'm like, no. I barely know how to use it. And so I gave him everything, and he's like, okay, I'm going to drive. I'm going to do all the transitions and everything, and you're just going to sit there, and you have to watch me. And I'm like, that's actual torture. I, I feel like it's illegal in some countries. It probably is, but you know what? This, this way, it's on me. If there's anything that's wrong with this episode, it's on me. And that way, uh, you know, you're absolved of all guilt with that So I, I'm going to have to yell at him <laughs> quite a bit for this episode, and this episode visually, and maybe even a little bit audio it's going to be a little wonky, but that, that's fine. Like, as these guys, like, by next next week, like, these we'll guys are going to have uh, time to, like, uh, practice with everything, and then it'll be fine. Oh, I will get it. Uh, well, anyway, we do have some excellent news stories to talk about this week. We've been off for a couple weeks, but we, uh, let's see here. We're going to talk about the uh, Air Canada flight that had the sudden turbulence. Um, and then also this terrifying account of a Delta Airlines uh, McDonnell Douglas engine failing mid-flight uh, before taking an emergency landing. So some aviation stories, as well as uh, uh, look into how to reduce hospital noise and creating uh, alarms that whistle and sing. Uh, and last but not least, a hospital introducing a robot to help nurses uh, that they didn't expect was would be so popular. But first, you know, we have some programming notes. Like Jeff mentioned, he usually gets this out on Tuesday, uh, typically around noon. However, I think with the change in the format, we might even be able to bump these up to monday night so stay tuned for that we'll see how well this goes um and uh you know what i i think it's time for us to get into a banter so jeff you already told us a little bit about what's going on with you do you have anything else that you want to jump into well i guess or is it mainly um, the well i guess it was mainly my role as the editor so like i'll still be uploading like on youtube i'm still uploading two of the audio like the old human factors cast per week so if you are subscribed on YouTube to the Human Factors Cast channel, you'll get two audio-only episodes, old ones, that just kind of being slowly re-uploaded. And then uh, you get the normal show once a week, uh, usually on Mondays. And then um, as far as editing goes, so I'm not really going to be editing like the Monday show anymore, but 
um, I will still be there to like make new assets if they want like a new intro or something once in a rare while I can do that or if they want to do like a like a HFES coverage or something want to make special videos I can still do that but otherwise I'm going to be stepping back a little bit and these guys are you got the controls and they're quite excited about uh, yeah but we're, we're going to go for a full rebrand next week so look forward because Jeff's going to get it all good to go by next week uh, I'm just giving him a hard time <laughs> It's 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 gonna be. I'm having so much fun this week. It's so much fun to have you on the show, Jeff. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I know I do all this editing and then like I I, 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 I mean I never even come over to you guys. I know. Well, now you're here. Welcome, welcome to the here. show. Uh, Everybody, give Jeff a warm welcome. Go over to his uh, channel, Offlineable, on YouTube, and give oh, him a sub. Oh, thank you. Uh, that's just where I dump all my. Oh, we'll talk about that at the end of the show. Let's talk about uh, <laughs> Human Factors cast stuff. Wait, does anyone, anybody else have any banter? Well, yeah, I want to. I want to say, Blake, you have something interesting here on the uh, on the page that I want to talk about. Oh yeah, so I've I don't know how many people remember from however many shows it's been now, but I have a new puppy. New puppers. Yep. Ooh. And so it's been a blast, like getting to know this dog, like the ins and outs of him. But I've noticed he's hyper intelligent, and just exercising him is not something that's enough to make him tired. Taking him out and like running him, his brain is still running all the time. Um, mm. So we started giving him like dog puzzles. Now, for you guys that don't know, you can get pretty expensive puzzles like at PetSmart or anything like that, where you like hide food inside these little, little balls or boxes or whatever it may be. But a dog trainer recently told us this trick where if you take a cardboard box, which Nick alluded to earlier, we've both been moving back and forth, or maybe that was in the Slack. So I've got like a plethora of boxes that we don't have anything we can do with. So I've cut a bunch of holes in a box, and this guy loves boxes with holes in them more than expensive dog toys. I swear. And it's just, it's one of those things that even with, as a kid, I'm sure I did the same thing. I'd rather play with the box than the actual thing that came in the box. Right, yeah. So it's been just kind of funny to see how they emulate behavior that you kind of see in how how does he play with it? Like, do you like put treats inside the box and so, they try to get it out, or like? So what I've done is I've started putting some of his toys in the box, and then he's got to oh, figure out how to open how up to the get, box. Like so an escape room for dogs. Basically, yeah. So we started with just like closing the top, and now I fold the top closed. It's it's hilarious to watch him try and get the stuff out of it. <laughs> uh, well, I have not a whole lot to talk about. I've just been under incredibly high stress uh, under prolonged circumstances because. Um, we have uh, started the transit. Like I mentioned in our Slack earlier, we've been um, we missed last week's show because there's been a couple scheduling issues between me and Blake. And uh, last week you were sick, and then I was packing, so we couldn't make up the show. But it's just been because we're packing, and we've kind of started the process a lot earlier than we typically have in the past. So we started packing months in advance now, where like a lot of our comfort items, and by that I mean like the stuff that we've put up on the shelves to kind of express our identity. Like uh, my partner has her oddities or whatnot, like her cat skulls and her pig fetuses and whatever. And that's comforting to her. And she has those up on the shelves. And I have my Star Wars memorabilia that's up on the shelves. And it's not even like a, 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 a thing that I go to normally. It's, it's like just having it passively there and then having it packed and away, out of sight, out of mind. Um, I don't know. There's something about just the stress of moving and the combined feeling of having your current uh, place not feel like a home because everything's put away is mm. just kind of, man, it affects you more than you think it does. You already moved to your... No, no, no. We're, we're, we're moving uh, later. I, I think we're still two weeks out. So, okay. yeah, it's, it's just uh, crazy. So two more, two more weeks without any of our uh, comfort stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not a good feeling. Like when, if, once you move somewhere or if you're in somewhere like an apartment or something and it's empty... Mm -hmm. And like it does not feel like a home. Like you feel, it, you feel very vulnerable. Very, yeah. it's out there in the big scary world. But uh, it's it's also surprising how quickly it feels like a home once you do move in. Like yeah, I it, mean, at, at least in my in my experience, it's it's always felt very quick. So I hope that also happens with you. Yeah, I think so. Uh, we're just very excited to start nesting and like getting baby's room good to go and and uh, you know kind of. Yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff that we're really excited about. So hopefully uh, we can I can report back on that in a few weeks. But you know what time it is? What time is it? It's time for Jeff to have a heart attack. Because it's time for Human Factors News. We'll see if I did that right. Uh, I think I did it right. It looks pretty good. It looks pretty good. Uh, this is the part of the show where we talk all about Human Factors News. This could be anything uh, related to the field of Human Factors. 
uh, you know, like medical, we got a lot of. We got aviation in there this week. You name it. As long as it relates to the field of human factors, it is fair game for us to talk about. So, Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right. So, first in our aviation stories, we've got dozens of passengers aboard an Air Canadian flight from Vancouver to Sydney, Australia last week were injured after the aircraft met at unforecasted and sudden turbulence, forcing the plane's pilots to make an emergency landing in Honolulu. So an Air Canada made, uh, official made an official statement estimating that about 35 of the 269 passengers on the flight suffered minor injuries in the accident. There was a total of over 15 crew members on the aircraft, and Air Canada still keeps in line that its first priority is safety amongst all its flights. Passengers and crew members, as a precaution, were met with medical personnel on standby as they landed in Honolulu. So this is kind of nuts. There's not a whole lot of great details of what really caused the turbulence or how it was unforecasted, but this is just like a pretty good example of how things can still go wrong even with so much that's automated in the air. Yeah. Uh, this is scary. I, like the, the aviation stories this week uh, are a little rough. Like, I... I Go ahead. We've got two of them. We, we do have two of them. <laughs> um, th yeah, they're both pretty scary. Um, I wanted to get you guys' input on how, uh, specifically the first one, or actually maybe both the, inter the, the plane ones relate to human factors. Yeah. Well, I mean, this, this first one is, um, it ha to me, the reason I pulled this story was because it has more to do with like the process involved with being inside of a plane. Uh, you know, turbulence can strike at any moment. And there are processes and procedures in place uh, for when to sort of buckle your seatbelt, when to stay seated. I mean, the, the guidance is uh, to remain with your seatbelt on unless you need it off. Um, but like, what what kind of key, what kind of environmental cues can we provide to uh, passengers to make sure that they're wearing them? Um, because like this article it mentions, like 35 people were injured, uh, likely because their seatbelts weren't. In. It's actually in the uh, interview, at least the video interview, if you go watch the video, uh, someone does say that most of the people who did get injured were not wearing their seatbelts. So I guess unless you have someone kind of walk around once in a while like, hey, put your seatbelt on. <laughs> right. I mean, like, like, first off, how do you enforce that? Two, how do you sort of convey the importance of, you know, having your seatbelt on? You, d you never think about it because most of the time your flights are smooth um, unless, you know, you're in one of these two cases that we saw this week. I don't know, Blake, what do you think about human factors applications towards this? I think it's an awesome use case for like crew management and the fact that you know, this stuff is already in place to take care of. If you do have sudden turb, yeah, I think about 15 crew members had to figure out what they were supposed to do, what was going to be the safest procedures to keep the most people safe as they could. Because, I mean, as the article mentions, it's like 35 out of 269 passengers injured. So that's a pretty, pretty low rate. So to some degree, right. they were doing their job. But also... You have like two pilots that had to deal with you know sudden turbulence out of nowhere and figure out what who to contact, what ATC channels to switch to to determine where they could make a quick emergency landing because it's a long flight. We're talking from Vancouver, to Australia, so I think it's just a great you know showcase of even though there's so much like automation and technology built into these, it relies on a very basic human level of understanding instructions and knowing how to take care of safety. Yeah, I, I mean. It's it's crazy to know that the the damage or the the injuries were so bad that they needed to land somewhere. They needed to divert the flight, um, and there's this whole other sort of human factors issue of like, like you said, like how do you communicate with ATC to make sure that there's like uh, clearance to land at these places, and especially on a route like this, there's only one place you really can land. Yeah, uh, and so now you've got to interact with ATCs, and some people sometimes forget there's also like another intermediary you have to deal with called a dispatcher for your airline. So now you're having to interact, probably since it's an Air Canada flight, with a completely different dispatcher to help you get landed in a specific place that you weren't supposed to be. Right. I know um, also in the story, some of the flight attendants were injured as well. So I imagine the stressful day at work when the plane takes a huge sudden turbulence bump and a whole bunch of people including you are injured and now even though you are injured you kind of have to still make sure you see the safety of everyone else uh which is also scary i was trying to think of any interesting human factors applications i mean unless they develop some sort of like intelligent uh seat belt system to like <laughs> they get like giant right. tentacle arms that like grab you if it <laughs> senses like extreme turbulence but i you know we're not going to see that 
Yeah, but. I mean, I mean, like there are there are other safety measures that they can make, right? Like uh, padded ceilings, although that adds weight. There's there's all these trade offs when it comes to aviation, right? Mm. And it's usually the trade off is weight and performance of the aircraft, uh, and that's why you don't see a whole lot of passenger comfort, and you pay a pre- premium for that type of luxury on these types of airplanes. But um, you know, I- I imagine if there was padding on the top uh, where where you sit normally. Um, and just imagine instead of like hard plastic, it's um, padded. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, like just padded. It was padded. And so like if you were to hit your head on that, maybe it wouldn't be so like, you know, the impact might still damage your neck or whatever, but at least you wouldn't have a scar on your head or so. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> or depending yeah. on the phase of flight, somebody like, a, like you were talking about a second ago, there may be a flight attendant who's up out in the cabin. Some paddle like that's available that could potentially save their life, right. depending on how bad it is. Absolutely. Um, I feel like maybe just like the padding they have it. Like, have you ever been to a, like a trampoline park? Yeah, those are incredibly dangerous. <laughs> yeah, they're still they're still dangerous, but they have uh, they take great care to like make sure like everything is padded. So, I mean, there's only so much you can put on an airplane and make sure like it's good padding. Also, yeah, and also the what you said with the trade off with performance and weight. Um, but I think that would probably be the best option. I mean, I know in cars, like they'll have like handlebars and stuff you can grab onto. It. But it's it's still I don't know if you could put how many yeah. things like in, into a plane, and I, I don't know if they'd even be helpful. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's worth to talk about aviation safety just as like a, a a whole after this next story. So Blake, why don't you go ahead and get into it? Absolutely. So there are many things that you never want to see when you're looking at an airplane window. In the next video and description, you'll here is definitely one of them. So in a video posted to Twitter, one on one of Delta Flight's 420, 1425's engines can be seen with what appears to be a spinner completely detached and rattling around in the inlet, all while an extremely ominous orange glow emanates from the deep within still spinning in the shaft. Fortunately, the flight crew was able to make an emergency landing with all 148 passengers aboard unharmed, if a little bit shaken up. Delta put out a statement that the flight crew received an indication of a possible issue with one of the aircraft's engines, leading to the pilot to contact ATC, declaring an emergency, and then they were able to get the crews there to meet them on the rollout. So an interesting fact about this particular aircraft, which is an MD-88, one of the oldest planes in service with any major U.S. airline, and has earned a notorious representation among pilots due to its antiquated controls, cramped cockpit, and extreme noisiness. In this case, some other interesting flaws, but it's pretty intense to watch this video. I remember when you sent this into the Slack, it was a little oh. bit freaky to watch. Oh, yeah. It was, it's incredibly like surreal, I guess, is, is the word I'm looking for to, to kind of look at this. It's like you can't believe it's happening, and I can't even imagine being on um, sort of one of these, one of these flights. Uh, that like, if, if you're sitting where that guy was sitting, would you be sitting there filming that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, because, like, what are you going to do? Get up and sit in the aisle? Like, there's nowhere for you to go. I, I would feel like the safest place for me, at least personally, like, the safest place for me would be sitting down with my seatbelt on, but that's because I know at least a little bit about planes to make me want to sort of, um, you know, at least sit down and, and, and uh, stay safe. I think my flight response would activate i would feel like i need to move to like a different part of the plane so in case like the engine blows up it won't take out that chunk of the plane that i'm in but i mean there's yeah you're right there's only so much you can do in a situation like that um i found something interesting in here the article said something that um the people who own the aircraft the uh the company that owns the aircraft it, it developed some sort of like notorious thing where a lot of pilots didn't want to fly it because it's old and like the controls are weird. But they provided, rather than like decommissioning the planes or like getting new ones and stuff, it sounded like what they did was they offered bonuses to pilots who would, uh, wow. they, they could promote to captain quicker if they fly these more yeah, often. It's way less expensive you know, buying a whole plane for them. That's sure. true. It sounds like a classic case of like uh, avoiding safety regulations in order to, be, I mean, but maybe we can give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe I'm sure it takes a long time to like order and buy a new plane because they might have to build it and like ship it and everything. So 
I'm sure that it, it might take a long time. So maybe right. this is just their temporary solution. Like while they're like getting new planes, maybe they were in the process of transitioning this out, but we don't really know that. Well, uh, so so that's a good point. So our resident uh, aviation expert in the Slack, uh, <laughs> Mateo, he's he's out there. He's been on the show too, friend of the show, Mateo. Um, he actually <laughs> wrote a, a point about that. He he goes. I, I certainly wouldn't be trusting them, but you can see how the industry t tries to hang on to, or hang on as long as they can. Not great when the consequences are so dire. Um, so uh, he also mentions that they are due to be retired in 2020. So that's something, I guess, to look forward to. Th these things are like on their last leg, I feel. so. Mm -hmm. I guess, but the thing that's a little irritating about this, Delta mentions that they did have this particular aircraft have the engines placed for the flight on Wednesday. Hey, great, it's an old aircraft that you replace the engine for, but obviously some issues probably won't get resolved with like a little mm. scary. But I don't know. Who knows? Maybe maybe Mateo's like optimistic viewpoint on it. it's not that far away. Yeah. So so kind of backing up and looking at airplane safety as a whole, I, I don't know if these two these two stories don't really have anything in common that we can kind of pull from, but we can definitely talk about airplane safety and I, I don't know. It's always things like this when you get the frequency of these types of events where you look at it and you say, okay, th is there something systematic that we can look at here? Um, like who was doing the pre-flight checks on uh, this this engine, right? It was just replaced. Um, and so maybe the personnel on the ground or the, the inspectors, I think the pilots actually have to go around and inspect the whole thing before they actually fly it. So I, I don't know if the fact that it was replaced so recently, if that was a reason why maybe the inspection wasn't as thorough, perhaps if it was like, um, I, I don't know. I'm sure you have to like trust whatever maintenance crew that puts it together and the reports they have to go through and all that kind of stuff. Because as a pilot, you only get so much time between flights and you're basically doing pre-flight check with your you know, co-pilot or whoever else right. may be in the cockpit with you at the time. So it's not like they're doing a thorough look down of the maintenance that's been done. They're just trusting, okay, it has been done? Cool. Let's um, I think the, the cool thing that is right between the two stories is there obviously is some very good systems in place for safety when it comes to thinking about crew resource management and just aircraft pilots and flight crews working together when, when something bad like this happens. Because I think either one could have been super tragic had they not taken the right precautions. Oh, you're right. I, you're right. I think there's we definitely got to give credit where the credit's due. I'm sure they have so many... Uh, safety features in place and I'm sure all the personnel have been trained to deal with situations like that which may be why everyone was okay in both scenarios uh, maybe a little bit of luck in there too yeah <laughs> but um, um, I think two big things that we can really learn from I guess both of these stories is one that Nick brought up is uh, there's always like caveats between making sure the plane is going to perform well and also making sure to have enough safety things like there's only so much you can cram into a plane uh, in order for it to fly efficiently. Uh, so that that caveat, you, you have to make sure you balance like how many safety features can you implement and which ones make sense. Um, and the other one I forgot. That's okay. But Mateo <laughs> does bring up another good point. Like, um, <clears throat> you know, he, he wonders when sort of airplanes will be focused on safety and passenger experience. And I mean, we saw this, uh, I think, with a story a little earlier this year where I think it was Canada was focusing on like the passenger experience from like boarding the plane all the way to departing, um, and so it, it was kind of interesting to see that shift. Uh, and it'll be I'll be curious to see and and Matteo too he actually brings this up. I'll be curious to see when maximizing profits becomes less important than um, you know safety and experience being the main objective. Uh, so he also goes on to say he'll wake up from his dreaming now. So you know there's that. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> I don't know. I feel like there's a bright future in aviation, especially as automation gets more intensive. We like aircraft that are actually flying themselves. Um, but the thing in Canada you got to think about, too, was that that's the entire experience. There's a lot of work to be done, like getting into the side of it and actually right. getting on the aircraft. So I think it's a, in a lot of ways it's going to be up to aircraft companies themselves to kind of design the experience. Actually work. Yeah. Any other closing thoughts on airplane safety? So All right. It stays as safe as it is. Okay, well, we'll be back to break down the news stories right after this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. 
You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. All right, and we are back. Uh, I just want to thank all of our friends over at Gizmodo, uh, New York Times, and Fast Company for all of our news stories this week. If you want to follow along with uh, the original articles, we do post those as we find them. Uh, you can find us all over social media or join us on our Slack, like I mentioned earlier, for links uh, to those original articles. Uh, and in Slack, here's an added bonus. You can actually join the discussion with us and have those like little mini conversations uh, with us in... in uh, in the days that we are not recording on a Monday night. Jeff, I want to check in. We are halfway through the show, and I think I have nailed pretty much every transition so far. I was very concerned, like, when we were getting into <laughs> it. Nick has been doing, like, a fantastic job with, like, all of these transitions. They are pretty much on point. I really appreciate that because, like, I mean, all the anxiety of me, uh, my anxiety would be through the roof if you were just screwed everything up. But you've been doing a great job. And Thanks, man. And I, I think I, I underestimated you. I, uh, well, I'm not going to issue an apology until after this is over. Okay, though. well, we'll there's, get there. There's, you don't get an apology <laughs> yet. All right, let's get into the next one. All right, Blake, what's up next? All right, so have you ever noticed that medical devices can sound so terrible in the hospital? Well, a group of clinicians, psychologists, musicians, and designers are developing that are less startling and formative. This is all started with an unsettling hospital stay for Yoko Sen, who founded a startup that creates more pleasing sounds for medical devices. So for some patients, it may be the last sound you ever hear, the beeping of a medical device or sounding of an alarm. The hospitals today can definitely be sonic hellscapes with alarms, devices, sounds of human pain, all sorts of sounds. But when it comes to hospital device manufacturers, in, uh, the thought of sound is often an afterthought in their design. They are worried more about being sued to the machine actually sends out a false alarm. They are, they are also using sounds that are based on outdated sets of international safety standards. So Sin's startup is working to make choir alarms, combining audible alarms with visu visual cues like interactive screens that look like paintings, and working to develop a new standard that is actually likely to go into effect in the next year. So among the tones that were approved for use was a tune reminiscent of the old MB and to mimic the rising and falling. So this is pretty interesting because I had never really thought of like sound design when it comes to being in a hospital. Because most of the time you're thinking about just the immediacy of an alarm going off and having to react to it. Not really the patient experience. Yeah, uh, anyone who's been in a hospital uh, kind of knows the plethora of noise pollution that is... Uh, <laughs> all these different alarms and uh, noises going off. And it can be kind of a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It can, it can be kind of overwhelming overwhelming, and also worrying. If you are in there to visit somebody and you hear a, an alarm go off, even if it's to like replace an IV, you're like, oh crap, is everything okay? Like, uh, hey, somebody get in here, something's going off. And the people in this environment, the nurses and doctors who are working around these patients, they are kind of, they, they hear it, and they know that it's not urgent. However, for somebody just being in there, like, it can be, it can drive up your anxiety. Um, and so, also, so, so I'm talking about from the perspective of somebody who's, like, being there for somebody else. However, I've also been on the other end of it where, you know, you're in the hospital for something, uh, appendectomy, whatever, um, and, you know, like, the thing is, when you hear those alarms go off, uh, you're like, oh, is everything okay with me? Like, does somebody need to be here right now? And if it's a little bit more soothing, I can see how that could go a long way to sort of easing anxiety in an already stressful environment for not only, for everybody involved. Like, the patient, the person visiting the patient, the doctors and nurses who are treating the patient, like, everybody involved can, uh, the stress level can be super high. Absolutely. I wonder if, like, the, by changing or paying more attention to the sound design, if you can get more accuracy to 
coming in to respond to a patient or they're responding just to a device going off. You know, it could, you know, change the immediacy in which people feel like they need to get into. Uh, regarding my thoughts about this, at, on the surface value, when I first read the story, I thought it was kind of dumb because... Uh, I, Get least, out. <laughs> from my perspective, uh, after I read the story, my opinion changed. My opinion changed after I read it. But w when I first read it, I thought it was a little weird because, in my opinion, if something's happening where I'm in a hospital, I'm hooked up to a machine, and let's say my heart is failing, I want that, like, it made it sound like they wanted, like, oh, if you want to, like, have a nice little trickle of water or something, something relaxing or something, like, not so abrasive to the ears. But I feel like if my heart's failing in a hospital, I want it to be loud and abrasive, and I want everyone to know my heart is failing, that I'm going to die. I need medical attention. Um, but um, then I also thought, well, what about, what if it's something like an IV needs to be changed? That doesn't have to be so loud and blaring. Maybe right. that could be something a little bit easier on the ears and it, honestly that that type of alarm is what's typically going off um you do of course have the the um high stakes scenarios uh where your heart is failing but th you know you can have more urgent alarms for that but the like passive kind of just uh status quo keep keep things topped off like that doesn't need to be these like loud chirps um and they can be more soft in tones uh and i do want to point out so I was going to actually post this, but Mateo <laughs> beat me to it on the Slack. There's a 99% Invisible, art, um, I guess, podcast episode from May that actually talks about sound and health in hospitals and how uh, it, it talks about this exact thing. Uh, and it's worth a listen. Um, you know, they, they have uh, just about as much, as many subscribers as uh, Human Factors Cast. So if you go their way, let them know that uh, we sent you. But uh, do check out that episode. If it's, it's good supplemental material for uh, this podcast. Um, yeah, I want to bring in a couple other comments here to say that, you know, th this, this type of technology, you'd have to convert an entire hospital and, and all the devices at the same time, or else the soothing sounds would get drowned out. And that point is brought up by Mary um, in, in the Slack. And then uh, Mateo also points out here that the emergency and ICU. See what I'm doing? I'm, like, pulling in a lot of these. There's been a lot of great discussion on these on these. Uh, these stories. So anyway, Matteo con continues the discussion and says the emergency and ICU areas are the best places to start. So, but eventually the whole hospital will have to kind of get um, revamped. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, I I, th I think this makes a ton of sense. Uh, did either of you guys have to listen to that ninety nine percent? I didn't listen to the podcast. I did watch the the video. I, I watched the full video on the uh, oh. like what what they're doing. Uh, I thought it was very interesting that they have someone with a music background is actually like engineering noises yeah. and uh, notes and stuff so that even like they even did like different tiers. So they had one where it's like the most relaxing sounds and then they had ones where it's like it's still beeps, but they're like pleasant beeps or like little tunes or chirps or something yeah. so that people can tell that it's a different type of alarm. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. I guess... If I could compare it to like, or bring up an example, I, I feel like it's a little bit like a car horn. So cars generally have one horn. Um, generally it's loud and abrasive. Um, and it's usually for if someone's swerving into your lane and you need to honk at them and let them know to not hit you. Right. Uh, that's usually needs to be loud and abrasive. Everybody needs to hear. But what about those times when let's say you're, uh, someone's uh, blocking like a parking spot or something or you want or maybe in a situation where or you, you just want to, need just to let somebody know something. it's not like aggressive like they need an aggressive horn and like you they need like a little toot you just want to give hey, them a little toot like a, a little air tap hey light screen like, yeah <laughs> something like that you don't want to be you don't want to lay on the horn you just want to give them a little toot like hey uh you know check yeah a light screen that's the best example so having multiple horns for that would be Nice. So, and the same thing can be yeah. applied to hospitals, I guess. So, like the the big important alarms, yeah, we want those loud and abrasive. But as far as um, like the the little things, like there's so much that could be done to make uh, both patients and visitors and I, and hospital staff like help reduce like the amount of noise pollution that's going on there. And then uh, and that'll help with stress levels. And if stress levels are low, recovery time is usually lower as well. Yeah, I agree. Uh, although I do know some people, my partner, who really love just laying on the horn when people don't notice the green. Uh, <laughs> Blake, did you have uh, something to add here? I think the whole point to talk about this. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, we talked about this. The one thing that I thought when I read the story is why we can't reduce the amount of alarm we are even having in a hospital. Like, I, I think the designing the sound to be much more specific and engineered and pleasing is cool, but, like, with the amount of stories we've talked about in the industrial class or Microsoft HoloLens, I mean, giving that to nurses itself could change the way that they have to go figure out what they have to replace in a room. It could reduce yeah. the amount of alarms you have to have at all. Well, you just saying that sparked an idea. Is like, why why don't you have maybe just a dedicated role that goes... I mean, I mean they might have this. I don't know enough about the nurse practitioners and hospital settings to, to know this, but what if you just had a dedicated role that goes around and replaces everything? And um, maybe... You know, there's some artificial intelligence system that monitors the levels of everything and, and provides sort of the optimal um, pathway to top off people with these things before they even get to the point where uh, the, the alarms go off. Yeah, exactly. And I think, actually, funny enough, I don't know if you did this on purpose, but the next story I think is a good candidate for that to eventually happen, right? Well, hey, why don't we go ahead and get into the next story? All right. So nurses are in high demand. So the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that the number of jobs for nurses will grow over 15% between now and 2026, which is much faster than any other current job occupation. So the current shortage has left hospitals in a crunch, and few hospitals in Texas recently turned to an unusual solution, a robot named Moxie. But Moxie, which is designed and built in an Austin-based company called Diligent Robotics, isn't trying to act like a nurse. That diligent robotics is, oxy is designed to run approximately 30% of the tasks nurses don't nurses do that don't involve interacting with with their patients, like running errands around the floor or dropping off specimens for analysis at a lab. So the goals of Moxie is to augment the staff, and it's hard to argue that the robot is trying to take anyone's job. Everyone is trying to get the most out of their ner- nurses and, and push them further. So, like you were talking about, Nick, I mean, connect a robot with an AI system, and now you could have a lot of things being automated in the, you know, on the hospital floor or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I think if you can get an AI to do exactly what I just said, I think that's even better. Um, so, what is Moxie? So, Moxie, just to break her down, she's just a robot that's equipped with a robotic arm and a set of wheels on a base and can be pre-programmed to run errands around the hospital like we were talking about. So this is kind of a use case that they've laid out in the article for her. So she's hooked up into the hospital's electronic health record system, and nurses can set up rules and tasks that the robot can get and command what errands she can run and certain things that she can do and engaging stuff for a patient's record or whatever. Cool. So that's, that's insane that they've got, a, they've got her already hooked into just the electronic health record. Of yeah, the hospital. That's really neat. And the fact that they can just reference that uh, when they're doing this stuff is really cool. Really cool. I have <laughs> a lot to say about this one. Good. Because I, I, I don't. A, <laughs> th- th- this is a very interesting story. Um, Hit us with it, Jeff. All right. So, where do I begin? So, I guess the article, and I think there was a video that I watched with it. Um, or I think it was mostly the article. So, the, the article is saying that the robot was very well received in this one hospital and they um but there was another hospital that actually did not like the robot um what's that smug look on its face so yep. they <laughs> trying to take over <laughs> <laughs> um the re- they said that uh the hospital didn't one hospital didn't like the robot because the robot is slow so you can tell the robot um like the way it's designed right here i see that it has like a little tub generally what it's supposed to do is like you go tell it to like you can program it and it can go grab what you need and then come back with it. So that's just like doing the busy work. You don't have to run around and tire yourself out. But a lot of nurses and stuff reported that the robot's so slow that you can go, you can tell it to go off and go do something and then wait like five minutes and then go off and get it yourself and be back before it even gets back. Uh, so, well, which I, is really unfortunate. I wonder if that's, matter of like learning to integrate with it is there other things that you can be doing in the time that it's going to get it and maybe that's you know on the operator's part to learn when how far ahead of the curve to ask it to go do something to where you will be ready for that you know like if it does take five minutes to go grab something maybe um you ask it at a certain point so that way you can start working on other things and then boom it's right there when you need it i i to me, I think that's kind of a like process thing that needs to get ironed out, and I hope that's the case where, um, you know, 
hopefully somewhere down the line, um, you know, people figure that out. So I, I don't know. I think like most medical devices have right, grown a lot over the years. Integrated kind of like so putting a brand new thing like a robot in here, right, Nick? Practitioners, whether it's a nurse or doctor, or whoever's interacting with it, gonna have to think about okay, how does my workflow have to change now? How does my mental model of what needs to get done and when and what, what could I do while the robot five, ten minutes doing this? It is kind of like you said, you're kind of planning ahead in a different way. Um, which is, which can be probably taxing for any kind of operator. You're introducing something completely new, and now you've got to almost think how you even run your day to day in a hospital. Yeah, I I, I want to talk about one additional component that I didn't see in the article. Maybe they talked about it, but the the, the facial expressions. Um, I thought this was really cool <clears throat> because a lot of the human robot interaction pieces um, need to be understood by humans, uh, and uh, you know. I, yeah, I, I'm not seeing facial expressions in here at all. But but the uh, I can I the article did talk about something re regarding well, not yeah. necessarily facial stuff, but the one thing I noticed about Moxie is that uh, she looks cool. She's designed to look cool, but um, it's the designers actually said that the the purpose of the robot is actually to be like kind of like behind closed doors getting stuff for people and it's not really supposed to be like out there meeting like with the patients and stuff it's supposed to be kind of a behind the scenes thing but in a lot of their studies they mentioned that people were so interested in the robot they wanted to meet the robot and they wanted to see like what it can do and kids especially li liked it a lot and there was one little girl who actually like wrote a letter to moxie uh so it sounds like maybe instead of having this robot like be specifically designed to be behind closed doors doing stuff, maybe they should redesign it or maybe design a new one specifically for patient interaction. Like I can imagine this helping kids a lot. If they can really nail like a very expressive uh, face and make the robot look really cool, it could almost be like a mascot of the, the hospital and uh, people would love interacting with it. It can still do other things. Maybe it could uh, check like vitals for patients, maybe design it specifically to interact with patients. They might as well lean into it if people are interested. Yeah, I think there's another application here, too, that we're kind of overlooking, is that the fact that it does have uh, a face on it, you can very easily convey to the people around it what is going on with the robot, right? You can, uh, you can sort of convey system, sta system status uh, just at a glance. One application I'm thinking of immediately is, you know, if you put a determined face, you know, eyebrows down, kind of like smile on their face, you know they're, they have something in mind. Uh, and you know to get out of their way because maybe they're in a hurry to get this thing for somebody um, versus like, you know, maybe maybe it's just a neutral face and you're like, okay, well, I can get in front of this thing and it will go around me. It'll adapt to my move. You know, like basically there's a get out of my way mode uh, and a um, I'm a pushover mode. I don't know. like, <laughs> the, But you can do so much with facial expression. Like even if you just ask like, how's a patient doing? And they can give you like a smile or a frown, and that would let you know whether or not to go see them, right? Because this, again, ties into all these different medical records that the patient has. Um, I don't know. I, I, I can think of a, a, a couple different applications for this. Yeah, I mean, if, even if you, let's get real futuristic, tied into the health record, electronic health record, the amount of people fit, fit, tracking their electronically, if that's somehow hooking into your chronic health record, you could even have, you know, asking Moxie about patient number whatever on how she's doing, and she could quit and, like, give you a question to, you know, like, oh, okay, you probably need to go to patient, or, you know, normal face, she's... I actually think the robot is equipped with something uh, regarding patient records. I think there is a feature where, I, maybe it's just, like, a keyboard that pops out or something, but uh, certain records can be accessed or maybe even edited through the robot, I'm pretty sure it's just like a keyboard or something that pops out because you know how I, I, I wouldn't trust a robot to accurately update that stuff automatically. But um, I was also thinking, if it was designed to like move and like move stuff, maybe they have like two different robots. So you have like one robot to for like patient interaction and stuff. Actually, I'm thinking maybe a robot is not the best choice for going to grab stuff. 
wouldn't it be like I know this might sound uh, something like a big company would do. What you say. A big company. <laughs> <laughs> hold, hold on, uh, let me say it. It's, it's something like a big evil company might do. But wouldn't it be easier to hire like a like a temp worker or someone like a runner? Like that would create more jobs if you hire a runner to go get that kind of stuff. You pay for way. a robot once. You pay for a, a runner um, years over years of however many. I guess it depends how much you pay them, but yeah. you know that that could also be like a not so nice job to have, and we don't want that. We want people to be paid and have a a good job. But maybe and the other thing I thought of is, wouldn't it? Um, you know how in like banks or like certain mail rooms, like they have like the the pressurized tube system where like they send stuff up. Like, have you ever seen those? Like the yes. Yeah, uh, wouldn't it make sense for maybe a hospital to have something like that? So, like, someone in room 32 is like, hey, I need a uh, like new set of syringes. And then someone down there in, like, the, the stock room, like, sends it through, huh. like, a, a tube system. I feel like that would be a lot faster. I mean, you can't transport everything that way. Organs. Like <laughs> yeah, can you say we have a new heart? Hey, we need a new heart on floor 33 up in the uh, ICU. Please, thanks. I feel like this robot is just the beginning of something that could be very cool implemented in hospitals. I don't think in its current form it's going to stick around, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. Blake, how are we doing on time? Uh, we're good. All right. Well, nice. let's get ahead and get into this last piece. It came from. It came from. Yeah, we like to call this It Came From Reddit. Uh, so this is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics that the community is talking about. Uh, you know, any subreddit is fair game as long as it relates to the field of human factors. <sighs> I almost made it through, Jeff. I almost did it. Yeah, I almost it was did. a it's little okay. bit of a messy transition, but it was fine. It's okay. Audio, it's okay. audio, you all guys right. won't even hear anything all or right. see anything. Anyway, it's okay. If you're watching on YouTube, you know what I did. <laughs> <laughs> any. You know what I've done, and Jeff is mad, and now he can't praise me at the end of the episode. Now uh, I'm upset. You know what? Yeah. It's it's all water under the bridge. Okay, all right. You Just know for what today, though. Okay, thanks. I appreciate. It. All right, so we got two up this way. I think we got time. We got time for two, right? Yeah. We well, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Let's just go ahead and do two. Blake, which one do you want to do first? Oh, uh, let's start with the first. All right, let's go ahead and get into this first one. So this is uh, by user Big Fat Beard from the user experience subreddit. Uh, titled "Seeking Resources and Insights on Conducting a User Acceptance on Conducting User Acceptance Testing." Um, so they go on to write, "Hi everyone, I'm conducting my first user acceptance testing. User acceptance, whatever. It's, UAT. it's a Monday. UAT <laughs> in a couple months, and would love to hear from those of you who have been part of a UAT or conducted a UAT." Uh, I have found a couple of resources, but they have focused on the definition of UAT and the process. I swear if I have to say UAT one more time. Uh, I am looking for insights, materials, tips, do's, and don'ts. I've moderated user testing sessions in the past, but I feel like this may be a bit more involved. All right, Blake, what is a UAT? So this, this is really intense to me because they mentioned the fact that they've done user testing sessions. And now this is something that is saying, like, okay, you've built a system, you've tested it, now real users have to test and accept it. So this was something I wanted to get your take on, see if you've had any experience with this in our field. Because I know that there are big milestones that we have to kind of adhere to across when you're creating a software product. Is it going to make it through these big hoops at the end? Because I know that this yeah. exists both, like, in kind of our more contract line of work, but also, too, like, in you know, regular e-commerce software too, like where you created a, an entire, you go through the entire design cycle, go to launch a product, hate it. Yeah. So you just, loo you just lose out on any kind of resources. And a lot of times you're not going through this big structured UAT. Is the SUS an example of the system usability scale? Is that an example of user acceptance testing or is it like a... So with that, to me, that's a resource or like a metric you would want to use. Right, because it's something As that's nice and objective that you can that has had at least a lot of research behind it. Why people even bother using it? Right. Um, because to me, this is a lot of this is like knowing the correct measures that you need to employ that are nice and objective as well as subjective, but also to knowing upfront what you really need to get out of this use of acceptance test. What's really going to get you past the ledge of we know when we launch this thing, it's going to be successful. Yeah. So that's going to be very product dependent. Yeah, because this guy's asking asking for a, it seems like a lot more than just like process. He wants like insights. He, he wants insights into things to do or tips. And I think it really comes down to working with 
within your company and within your product team and saying like, okay, from a user perspective, what actually makes this thing that we're trying to import? Yeah, you know, you know what? I, I think, I hate to say it. You know what I'm going to say? It depends. It does depend. Yeah. And you know what, Jeff? Uh, I, I'm thinking about this now. We need like a separate section here uh, that just is like a big it depends overlay that's like got like, you know, the, the like rainbows and like stars oh. and everything. <laughs> just it depends. Every time we say it, it just flashes up. Uh, it could be a hotkey, essentially. <laughs> That'd be nice. Um, I, could, I could do something like that. <laughs> just like a little rainbow. It depends. But it does. It does depend uh, on sort of, yeah, what the needs of the project are, what, what the product itself is aiming to do. Is it something that the users have to use? Because that is a, a big uh, sort of limitation when it comes to user acceptance testing. If it's something mandated, like let's say you're in a company and that company orders you to use uh, Adobe Illustrator that, you know, maybe you're a Mac person and you prefer Sketch or something. I'm just using these examples, but, sure. you know, is does that factor in when you don't have a choice and how does that play into sort of the user acceptance testing? That's that's something that you have to consider. There's, uh, as far as tips, do's and don'ts, I don't know. Like, it depends. It, it just does. Depends. It's going to depend on the project. Because if it's something like you're talking about, like within a company, they want you to use, Specific, you know, suite of software. Right. That th that's then up to the company to decide. Like, okay, what level of training and time are we willing to spend? Like, as profitable business that also knows we have to allow designers or whoever it is, depending right. on what software, to get up to snuff that they're like meeting project needs. That's that's like a larger analysis on their portion. How much training and time can we provide just from company dollars to do this, make it high level versus where if it's a product. You kind of get a little bit of hit or miss if it's not somebody has to use. You have to like do a wide base of user right. testing. And then flip that script. Uh, is Adobe, in that example, using uh, using the the people who are using that software at that company that is mandating that they use that? Is are they including them in the user acceptance testing? Because if they don't have a choice, they're using it. Um, are those valid? I don't know. Yeah, that get that gets to be really tough, right? Because what it comes down to why are you for the tool will likely it's because if, as you hire people on you want products to look consistent workflow to be consistent but what does that really mean for somebody right. who's never used these products before do you hire people that don't have any experience doing it? it changes a lot of different things depending on like what the goal is to you yeah anything to add jeff no i think these okay. uh <laughs> mostly these these ones these two questions are for you guys um i guess i mean i never really just say it depends my, and we'll move on I mean, it really does <laughs> depend, though. Yeah, that's a really great insight there, Jeff. I think we'll we'll stick with that one. All right, we got time for one more. So this one here is posted by uh, user the unknown, uh, who says also from the user experience subreddit says, "I feel like I'm not learning enough at my internship." Now this is a big problem. Uh, this one's a long post, so stick with me for a second. Uh, I'm a final year design student. I'm currently working at a design firm, and it's one of the best in the country. Uh, but I haven't learned a lot. I was supposed to work on a design... I haven't learned a lot, like how to spell learned. I was supposed <laughs> to work on a design project, but I was assigned a research project that was more experimental and big than I had hoped for. Uh, my learning has been quite meager, and I'm disappointed because I turned down offers from one of the top three companies in the world and one fastest-growing startups. Mm -hmm. They both paid a lot more, and the name would have been a huge plus. I chose this because one of my design idols is a client here, and this firm is uh, moving very quickly. But over the last two months, I've effectively learned nothing. I've realized that one. I'm quite poor, and I do have to continue working, so I now have three options ahead of me. Stay at this option one. Stay at this firm and switch, switch to a design project. I'll work on it for six weeks. I could switch to the project that includes my design idol or work on a new project with two good designers. Two, switch to the startup that's doing really well. They offer more money, and I know they tend to expect a lot of hands-on work. Option three, stop everything, resume my education at university, which sucks, and freelance. Uh, in the future, I would like to work at a small startup and make a great product and build a great team. I know these sound like lofty goals, but I do believe that I can do it. What will help me get there? Okay, Blake, there's a lot to break down there. So why don't you just restate the questions really quick so we can get, a, uh, we can get anchored here. The biggest thing is the person needs to pick one of them and lay it out. So the options are all really good options. They feel like they haven't learned anything in their internship. 
part of that's on them, right? You have to be seeking opportunities on your own within the company that you're in or within, within whatever experience that you've chosen. It sounded like they had three options, made a choice. It may not have been the most optimal one. But what can you what can you personally do to keep pushing yourself or keep teaching yourself outside of your job? You don't feel like you're learning anything outside of it. Um, but I mean, the three options they presented themselves sounds like they have great things they can do ahead of them. I mean, you can go work with Idol. You can go back to school and freelance, which might not be a bad idea. I mean, that was something I was going to suggest just from the title is like trying to freelance do design work on your own because there's plenty of you know companies like Upwork or whatever it may be that you can get pretty simple and pretty quick freelance jobs that will allow you to get, get experience, experience that you may not be getting in your current job. But if, if you really want to work in startups, it sounds like the, the door is already open. That's like the goal is to work with a smaller startup and grow a team, then just go walk in that door, finish the internship you're doing now, and just apply to a startup. Uh, yeah, um, so... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead, Jeff. I, well, I have an opinion <laughs> about it, I guess. So um, it's also a little bit about my qualifications. I know you don't need to have, like, human factors uh, degrees and stuff to necessarily be a voice on this podcast. All voices are appreciated. Yeah, but, I mean, um, you have a psychology background, so, I mean, there, that helps. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology, and it was focused more on research. Uh, it wasn't intentional, actually. I went in thinking I was going to be a counselor for some reason, and then I came out, and I'm like, I know it. how to conduct a research study. That's <laughs> you cool. Did it. But um, one thing I learned was that for college, I don't know, like it, personally in my, it, for my college experience, it was, uh, I, I didn't get, I feel like I didn't get too much out of college because uh, now I don't even do anything related to psychology, I guess. It's, uh, I do um, uh, speech therapy uh, for kids and teens with autism. So it's not really the same at all. So if I feel like if I was in college, well, he says here that, uh, he does not like the education at the university. He says it sucks. Uh, so if he feels that way, if he has, I mean, if I was in his shoes and I had an opportunity to go out and not only like work for other places and get experience, but also make money, it sounds like he's getting paid, at least in one of these things, or it's like paid internships. That's fantastic. I'm good on you. Uh, I would definitely pursue one of those options. I would not actually go back to university. University... I feel like it's just to learn specific things, but I feel like personally, I think that real world experience and actually earning money so you can survive trumps all. Uh, I personally, if I was him, I don't th think I would go back or do university for that. Like, if you have other options where you can go earn money and get experience doing uh, like a few things, like I would go do that. Yeah. So this whole thing to me, and I don't want to sound like a jerk here, but this whole thing to me kind of sounds like a humble brag. <laughs> <laughs> I turned down offers from one of the top three companies in the world <gasps> uh, and one of the fastest growing startups. Uh, I'm currently working at a, at a design... I'm currently working at a design firm and it's one of the best in the country. Um, I think no matter what you're doing here, uh, you're going to be fine. Um, if you... Look, like we've said it before on the show, if you stay at this firm... Make the best of it. Like you, you can make your own path at these places, even if it feels like you're trapped in a corner. You said it yourself. You you can switch to a project that includes your idol, and uh, if you have that option, I don't understand why you're not already doing that already. Um, and you know, if if you're considering jumping ship and going to other companies, I would say at least try hanging out with your idol first. Um, I don't I don't necessarily like that term idol, but if you are working with somebody who you admire and um, you know appreciate the way they work, I would say at least give that a try. And if that doesn't work, then maybe start to consider. But this company is a, a for sure thing for you. This has already happened. They have already accepted you. Um, you might not be making as much as you want, but it is an internship, right? Like that's also something to sort of think about. Like if you're afforded these opportunities. Uh, how do you know that the other opportunities are still on the table? Like, you might have somebody on the inside, and that's one thing. But if you don't, then take the opportunities that you have and turn them into a plus. And I also, I also find that maybe sometimes these opportunities where you are forced into a hole also kind of provide you the best stories to tell for when you go to actually get hired. 
you can go in and say, look, I wasn't really doing all this design work, so I made a place for myself. I found a place for myself, and I did these things that weren't being done before. And that goes a lot more, that goes a lot further, at least in my book, instead of just saying, yeah, I did what they told me, and I worked on these great projects. Here they are. Um, I don't know. It, it's a more unique story. It's a, it's a stronger story to tell when you are interviewing with potential employers. That's my just my two cents. Um, I, I, I can second that. Um, any situation where you're, I guess, put into a situation and you were, had to take initiative to change things, employers love that. They, that's one of the best things you can possibly do. So if you're in a position uh, and you're like, you know what, something's got to change. I'm not learning enough. I've got ambition and I want to feed that. Uh, do something to feed that ambition. Do not just sit around. Uh, it, it's going to look great, and you'll be able to brag about it on uh, to potential employers. <laughs> yeah. Anything else, Blake? Just keep pushing. You'll be you'll be fine. All right, everyone. That's it for today. Let us know what you guys think of the new. Oh, whoops. No, I think. Wait. No, I'm messing everything up. There we go. No, that's good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff is having a yeah, heart that, attack. That over was here. That, <laughs> that was my fault. They gave you a false cue. You gave me a false cue. All right. I'm just going to sit over here and read my script. If you're a Patreon supporter, stay tuned. We are getting back to the after show. I promise. We just pinged our Patreon supporters on the Slack. For the rest of you, you can join us on our Slack and uh, follow us over any so of our social media channels at A-Tractors Podcast. If you want to leave us an email, that's show at humanfactorscast.com. If you like what you want to hear, support the show. You can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank my guests for being on the show today. Uh, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, where can our listeners go and find you? Oh, you guys can always find me anywhere. Don't panic you. And Mr. Jeff Olson, where can our listeners go and find you? Well, uh, the only online presence I have is just uh, a YouTube channel where I just upload anything related to editing or personal projects. And there's all kinds of like a whole plethora of weird stuff. So if any of that sounds interesting, you can go to YouTube.com slash user slash offlineable. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning into Human Factors Cast. Until next time. It depends. It depends. It depends.